A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Our cases this week, a mother who has been jailed and charged with killing her three-year-old son was allowed out to attend her child's funeral. The mother was charged with involuntary manslaughter after giving the three-year-old Benadryl and then leaving him in the bathtub for over an hour. She claimed that the death was accidental and that she fell asleep because she'd been working hard. It is without question a tragedy, but what would justice look like in this case? And should she have been allowed out to attend the baby's funeral? But first, can you imagine your boyfriend who is a cop making up a story about how you should be committed to a psychiatric hospital against your will and the guy succeeds? Investigators in Pennsylvania say that a scorned trooper who was married and having an affair solved his problems by committing his mistress to a psych hospital. The trooper, who has since been arrested, actually made a video showing how he restrained the woman until officers could arrive and commit her. Take a look at this video. I'm not going to any jail. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going anywhere. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What is wrong with you? Would you do this? Our guest today is Allison Treasel, a criminal defense attorney, a legal analyst for KTLA TV and Access Hollywood, and a dear friend. We love Allison. Hi, Allison. Welcome back. So nice to be on your show, and you always pick such riveting and interesting discussions and cases. Um, and uh, this one has not failed us because this first story is chilling to me, really chilling. It's so scary. You know, when I think of what, what frightens me, imagine someone saying to you, you're crazy, gaslighting you and, and committing you. And here you are truly the innocent person and there's nothing wrong with you. And you're like, but I'm not crazy. Like, who's going to believe you? Wait, the problem here, Anna, is it's not just some person. This is an officer. And if you watch this video, you know um, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with her at all. No. And, you know, that's the thing. When someone is being wrongly accused of some of something and she's fighting for her freedom, I guess if you didn't know all the facts, you'd say like, wow, that woman's really fighting back. She's so feisty. Well, of course she is. Some, someone's about to commit her to, you know, an institution and she hasn't done anything right and i would even i i wouldn't even say that she's aggressively fighting back i mean she's trying to get him off of her yes but um but the facts are just um they're just horrific and it can happen and so i'm so happy we're covering this because um you know it doesn't take much to get somebody committed to a mental health facility oh my gosh the Yes, against their will. And the other part, and I still don't know the answer to this, is he videotaped the entire thing. He was off duty, so it's not like it was a body cam. It's just some friend of his that he asked to help him and said to the guy, can you videotape this? Why did he videotape this? I, I've said this so many times, and I've said it on your show, narcissism. When he believed he was doing a service, and when he's videotaping his alleged crime, because now he has been charged, um, he doesn't understand that he's actually sealing his own fate, in my opinion. Oh, the videotape? Oh, exactly, exactly. She's asking him why, what's he doing? Here he is, he's pinning her down. The video is 12 minutes long, and the entire time he has her pinned to the ground, chokehold, up against the car, you know, we're going to play all these segments for you. So uh, it's just an extraordinary case. It's out of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry, please go ahead, Allison. You know, and, and at some point she, she says, I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Yeah. And that's one of the charges that he's facing. Yeah. You know, in, in addition to, you know, right. uh, well, it's a litany of them. So we're going to yes. go through them. So this first case is out of Pennsylvania where a married state trooper has been charged with numerous felonies for allegedly fabricating evidence that gave him the power to have his girlfriend committed to a psychiatric hospital against 
her will. This case is so frightening when you watch the video, you, you will see it is beyond disturbing. The victim here is Michelle Pervinoff, and she was committed against her will for five days. The accused is a married Pennsylvania state trooper who also has children. The 37-year-old is Ronald Davis. He was having an affair with Michelle, and the two had been together for about four months. And as the relationship was ending, it looked like the trooper came undone. Right, and somehow she was living on a trailer on his property. So right. she, um, despite being married and having a couple kids, this woman who's having an affair with um, is living on their property. And not only does he get unhinged when the relationship collapses, he denies her access to her belongings. And at some point says, you know, I will get you for this. And um, he says, I know you're not crazy, but I can show you are. Imagine you've just been pulled into the hospital, a psychiatric facility. He said he did it because he was trying to save her from harming herself. He claimed that she was suicidal. So you can imagine you, you're literally carried into a, a psychiatric facility and, and you're trying to tell them, but wait a minute, I am not suicidal. This is against my will, right? Anyone who goes in involuntarily is going to say, well, this is against my will. There's nothing wrong with me. And juxtapose that with the person who has personally driven you there, who has gone through the steps to get this involuntary commitment order, is law enforcement, is a policeman in yes. a small town. Oh my gosh, it leave. is. And he did this off duty, again, off duty. <clears throat> so before we show you this videotape, which is truly vile, because it shows the trooper holding Michelle waiting for the cops to arrive. So here's a little bit of background. You know, Allison's told you a little bit, you know, she was living on his property in a camper. We believe the camper may have belonged to him, but but he was holding her belongings hostage, which was infuriating her. And they were in the middle of an argument that lasted several days. The two of them were fighting as their affair, their relationship is coming to an end. So according to court records, the two began their arguing about their relationship on August 19th. The reason we're giving you these dates is because these things occurred over the course of a few days and they severely escalated from, you know, a fight to I'm having you involuntarily committed. I mean, th th right. This was the res this was his resolution. Right. So um, Michelle had alleged this all came out in the court record that that, you know, this guy was controlling and that he restricted access to her things, that she, that he would cut off power to the camper to make it uncomfortable for her. What I don't understand is, Allison, is if if you're breaking up or you want to keep her or you want, you know, you're, you're upset because you want to have her still in your life, why are you turning off the power to this woman? Because you're only in- Because you're angry and you're, that you're being rebuffed. And there is an allegation, by the way, um, that he, she was interested in somebody else and he was angry about that. I mean, you know, of course he had a wife and children, but he was angry that she was interested in somebody else. He, because it's all about this trooper here. Yeah. It's, it's really unbelievable. So yeah. a few days later, so this is escalating now, on August 21st, Ronald, who was off duty at the time, and I keep saying that because it's important. No, it's Be very important because he uses his position of power um, to do the things and justify the things that he did allegedly. But at the end of the day, he you just because you're a police officer, it doesn't give you unlimited, unchecked power to do anything that you want. If you commit a crime, you commit a crime. And because he is a police officer, and we've seen this before in areas where police officers have been in, involved in child abuse and severe domestic violence, that the courts and the system and the responding officers always seem to give deference. Well, I mean, the, the, the only case you need to know for that example is the one on Long Island where the, yeah. the police officer, even though his, his ex-wife was saying, the son's being abused, the son's being abused, she worked in law enforcement but was not a police officer i believe she worked at the jails and the guy on long island despite numerous 
reports of abuse, the one that, that he and his wife left the child out in the, the garage to freeze to death, yes. um, a lot of that can be blamed on the deference that the that law enforcement gave to a fellow officer despite social work involvement, despite teachers' complaints. And so this is an extension of that, or this is something that you we have to do better. We have to believe that even though this person is a police officer, nobody's above the law, and they can be, when off duty, committing really horrible acts. Absolutely. And the thing is that he came across as, you know, the the guy who was worried about the woman he was having a relationship with. Apparently he was a somewhat forthcoming on why he knew this woman and how he knew her. And so he's trying to get her committed, he said, because she wanted to harm herself, because she wanted to kill herself, because they were, you know, the relationship was ending. So when you present it that way, and when someone makes, and we'll find also later in the text messages that she did make a comment about, you know, killing herself and driving off a cliff, where when someone makes a comment about wanting to harm themselves, we do have to take that seriously. Agreed. Uh, agreed. agreed. And, and so that's what muddied this. And he used that, according to the For district sure. attorney, he he used all of this sure. to fabricate this. Yes. And, yeah. and, you know, and I do want to be sensitive to the fact that she did make a statement um, of, of harming herself, which she later said, she told police later and she told the doctors at the hospital, she said, I said that to make him angry to get back at him, you know, because she was in the middle of a fight with him. Well, and this is where if he let's say he was truly concerned about her safety, then a neutral third party should have been involved in this involuntary commitment business. It's he that's holding her down and restraining her. And that was not in line with the police protocol at all. Wow. He is, he's a piece of work, Allison. I agree. I absolutely he's, agree. Okay. So let's get back to the day that this yes. all happened. Yes. So according to prosecutors on August 21st, Ronald, who again, I keep saying it, was off duty, spoke with a supervisor at the Dauphin County Police Station. He is a state trooper, Pennsylvania State Police, and he's talking to the local authorities here. So you need to also understand he's working in a different jurisdiction. So he goes to the local police station and he says, I need help with my girlfriend. She's suicidal and she's a danger to herself. The investigators are now saying that you know, Ronald claimed that Michelle was acting erratically and that he showed some evidence to the police, He, you know, to substantiate what he was saying. And that's that text message. And now here is the text. Now, here's what he did, though. He only showed a portion of the text message. It so it's out seen in context. It was not exactly. seen in context. Exactly. So and he made it, yes, I look dire. The, I read the probable cause statement, um, which is fairly extensive. And I'm not sure how much he disclosed about their tumultuous relationship. Um, and it seems that he left out substantial portions of relevant facts that they were going through trouble in this relationship, that he was married with, other, with children, that she, he thought that she may have been interested in somebody else. So there was jealousy and rage there on his part. So he presented a limited, distorted view of what was really going on. Yes, and this is the text message that he used to convince the local authorities, and then ultimately he had to call another department to convince them to issue this order to have her committed. And the text message he showed them was, quote, now this is from Michelle to him. My mental health doesn't matter. I'm a useless, old, stupid, uneducated piece of blah. And I think I'm going to drive off a cliff. So he uses that as his ammunition to have her committed to ex trying to explain, look, she's a danger to herself. What I'm doing is I am rescuing her. Yeah, I, um, I was interested to see what an involuntary commitment in Pennsylvania looks like. And it appears 
that the person must pose a clear and present danger to their self or others based on statements or behavior that occur in the past 30 days. Um, there are two parts to this, what they call a 302 petition, um, and it's an evaluation and admission. But what I, what I found most interesting is that it appears that the people that submit these, position, these petitions are either a police officer or a medical doctor. So he knew that if he used his position as a police officer, he had a much greater chance of getting approval for that involuntary commitment than a civilian would. And I want to spend a minute on this because involuntary commitments of an adult over someone 18 um, is one of the greatest deprivations of anybody's liberty. And so they should not be taken lightly. And certainly they deserve complete context and full disclosure of, hey, by the way, this is my girlfriend. We're having trouble here. Our relationship has been marred with some fighting because according to her later on, she said he was so abusive and so controlling and um, I just wanted to get away from him. Yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh, this is so chilling. It's so, so frightening to me Yeah, that According to authorities, right? He got away with all of this. Yes, correct. correct. Ah, so when he shows this text message to the supervisor at the local police station, the supervisor says, look, you need to speak with the county crisis intervention team. We are not going to issue this order since and this is interesting because the supervisor said this feels like it's of a personal nature. So the local cops didn't want to get involved with this, and they didn't think it was their jurisdiction either. So kudos to them to not saying, let's help our, hey, you know, our buddy. our buddy over here. Yep. So he was not deterred. He decided, okay, fine. I will contact this organization, this county team. So the, according to the district attorney and the court records that have been released, then Ronald spoke with the crisis intervention team, again, misleading them. He identified himself, this is crucial here, he identified himself as a trooper. Okay, but he didn't tell them that he wasn't working when he was making this call. Right, he's off duty. Yes. So now this crisis intervention team doesn't realize, one, that he's off duty, and two, that this is of a personal nature. Yeah. They don't understand the details of it. Yeah. Deception. Yeah. They think it's a state trooper calling them with a woman who appears to maybe wanting to harm herself, and they need to do something to help protect her. And remember, according to the woman, this was something he had told her he could and would do in the future, acknowledging that she's not crazy, but because he's law enforcement, he'll be able to show that she is. Yes, and we will read you that text message a little later, especially after, after you see these videos, all these clips that we're gonna break down for you. Okay, so now while Ronald is working, here's the other thing, Allison, while Ronald is working on the commitment papers, he's waiting for them to come in to be faxed, um, officers from the local police department go do a welfare check. Okay, now I agree that that probably was the right thing to do if you think something's wrong. Very reasonable. Very reasonable, because we've seen where cops haven't done welfare checks and how bad the ending can be. Very reasonable. So the local cops go they check three locations given to them by him and she's not there so now according you know to the court records that have been released he starts getting agitated because they can't find her so yeah. you know as if his plan's not going to work but then anna he recruits a neighbor buddy to help him search and ultimately record the incident when they do find her how ridiculous is that? That is literally like, honestly, you're a cop and you're going to call a friend to help you? Are you nuts? Um, so bizarre. 
So, so bizarre. There is no possible police protocol for this. None. 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 And this guy, you know, the one who went along with it, who has not been charged in any way here, this person had no idea. They just thought that they were assisting with a woman who was trying to harm herself. So they just did what the trooper told him to do, which was to take the video. I mean, this other person who you will see, he's not holding her down. He's not doing anything. He's just, he's holding um, the phone to videotape it. And he's also calling authorities because during the video, both of them are starting to get like, well, the civilian is getting nervous and, and the trooper looks really agitated. He's like, where are they? She's biting me. I'm like, oh, wow. She's um, biting yeah. you? Really? Maybe and it's because she got her in a chokehold and yeah. she's trying to bite you. Well, and by the way, the witness would later tell the police that he... Um, he never, he never saw um, the woman in possession of a weapon. He did not believe that she was ever going to harm herself. And that Davis, the police officer, never informed him of an active police investigation um, and related that if he would have known that, um, he would have handled this incident very differently. So not only has he now deceived the police, and finagled and deceived you know the process of getting this involuntary mental health commitment but this witness says he never told me all of this i i mean i had no idea that there was an active police investigation that's according to the witness in the probable cause statement so just so you know that that part of the reason he went out there this is what ronald says because the cops at the local station said that he was starting to get so agitated that he said the other cops overheard him say i'll take care of this myself mm -hmm. that's a quote from the court record and that he storms out to find her and that's when he picks up the neighbor so you have to understand he's already got the papers they have now been faxed and the fact that the local police are not doing what he wants them to do in his time Hopefully frame. He wants them. Right, right, right. Right. That he's going to do it himself. Meaning, I think, my personal opinion is that he fears his plan is not going to work. Right, right, right. It's going to backfire. And the only way he can ensure that it doesn't backfire is if he does it himself, does the dirty work himself. I agree. I agree. Okay. So we're now going to play this videotape, and I know some of you are actually listening and not watching, so I want it to be as clear as possible for all of you. Uh, the portion we're gonna see is that everything takes place in a, in a grassy area. She's at a picnic area. So it's very green and very lush. So for those of you who are listening, this is taking place again, outside. Ronald is in plain clothes. Michelle is in shorts, a tank top, and sneakers like she would be at a picnic area. She has been separated from her purse, her phone. You will see this. And uh, when the video begins, she's actually pinned down on the grass. He's on top of her, but he's sitting on her in kind of what looks like a wrestling pose, right? But, but where she's immobilized. Where Completely. She's immobilized. So it looks like a typical police um, sort of, so, so you're, you're immobilizing them so you can cuff them. Correct. Right. Mm hmm And that's where we pick up the video. What's wrong with you? I don't need help. I need to get away from you. No. No. This is a normal. I don't care what anybody says. Can I please stand up? Now, Allison, because we're going to play this in parts, just immediately already, this is so disturbing the way he is so calmly sitting on her and she can't wiggle out and she's trying to. And she keeps saying, you know, that she doesn't understand. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? I need to get away from you. So not only does he have her in this very secured police hold where she's immobilized and she is sort of struggling to uh, free herself, the words are so disturbing to me because to me, and I've been doing criminal defense for almost 30 years. I deal with a lot of mentally ill people. I deal with a lot of difficult people who are struggling with the police. But rarely do you have a situation where someone legitimately says, 
why are you doing this to me? Because I don't agree with you. I'm not crazy. You need to get off of me. I have done nothing wrong. Why would you be calling the police? All I'm trying to do is get away from you. And, and it's that repeated and, it, and it's chilling to me because when you look at a, a normal sort of, you know, police takedown, the person is explaining, this is why we're taking you down. This is what is going on. She's repeatedly asking him, what did I do? And he sits there, and this is my personal opinion, like this total machismo who is exercising dominance and control over her and almost enjoying it. I mean, he's so calm about it that he is enjoying, and this is again my opinion, the the control he has over this woman. Because he's not trying to calm her down no. and he's not trying to explain things to him, to no. her, right? He's not saying anything, look, I'm just worried about you and the police are coming, please. He doesn't say any of that. He no, doesn't no, say any no, of that. No. Right? Right. Qu quite the opposite. Quite the so, opposite. So now it it evolves so when we start he's sitting on her she's on her back and he's got her pinned she wiggles manages to move a little and then we're picking up the videotape now where he is behind her and he's got the choke hold for those of you who are listening he's got his arm and elbow around her neck and and she's fighting and they're on the ground kind of like on all fours is the best i could give you Right, so what that is, is a triangular chokehold, and it is meant to constrict the airways. Um, it used to be very common in police takedowns. Uh, most manuals, um, police manuals, um, basically say that that should not, under almost every single circumstance be used anymore because of how constrictive it is and if you'll remember the george floyd case that was sort of one of the the signatures of the case is the way that there was that triangular hold and similar to george floyd she is saying to him i cannot breathe i cannot breathe because that hold is meant to constrict the air wave here's the tape Like that. Get off of me. Very disturbing, and we're only a portion of the way through this videotape. So, from that chokehold position, he manages to let Michelle stand up. But now he has taken her and he has pinned her against the back of the car. So it's the car, it's Michelle, and then him pressed up against her and holding her hands. You see her try to reach for her cell phone. He knocks it out. Now he's getting agitated. He's saying to the person that he brought, brought along, where are they? Where are, where are they? Where are the cops? Find out. She's biting me. It's like he's the victim here. She's biting me. Give me a break, buddy. Let her go. I... I in in she's biting him in self-defense and basically um you know self-preservation i mean the the man is choking her she has said i cannot breathe she ha he has her pressed against the car and um you know it's 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 almost it i was personally creeped out by that part of the video i i personally found it um, sort of enjoyable and sexual in nature for him, and it creeped me out. It it's very me. disturbing, and I don't know whether anyone would have believed her and her truth. Without the video. Without, Without. the video. Mm -hmm. That he, that it was at his direction that they filmed. Yes, thank God he's an idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now we're going to show you the part where she's up against the car, and, and again, listen to her words. Repeatedly, she's saying, I don't need help. I just need to get away from you. Boy, is that the truth. Here's mm -hmm. the clip. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't do anything. I 
didn't do anything. I, I honestly believe if there weren't this videotape, Allison, I don't know whether people would have fully believed her. Um, I don't think they would have believed her at all. And unfortunately, see, when I first started practicing many, many years ago, it was literally a police officer's word against my client's word. Okay, that, that's how a lot of these cases went down, especially if they if they they pull you over for some type of traffic incident that they claim resulted in resisting arrest or something like that. But the technology has changed so much that not only does every single person on the planet have a cell phone in their pocket that they can push record on. Not only are most police departments now equipped with body cameras and cameras on their vehicles, but there's this incredible statistic that a person in any town is captured on some type of video over a hundred times a day. So every single one of your movements is very clearly docu documented. What I love about it for the criminal justice system is if in doubt, you can turn to a unbiased videotape where a jury or a prosecutor or a judge can look at it and say, well, you have two sides to this pancake here. Which one is telling the truth? Well, the video isn't lying. So when someone comes to my office and categorically says, I didn't do it, I can find most of the time some type of exculpatory evidence to support their argument because of technology. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Now you rarely get a, a situation where what would turn out to be the aggressor and then a defendant in a criminal case is the, the video footage that he is using is actually going to be used against him to potentially convict him. To take away his free will, shall we? Correct. Yes. So now let's get to the hospital. Michelle gets taken to the hospital and she's telling doctors, I am not suicidal. I am not crazy. You know, and I'm not a threat to myself. And, and what's revealed in the court records is that the doctors say, you know, they... They legally, truly didn't have a choice. They could not release her immediately because they needed to evaluate her because she came in with an order, an order to take her in because a state trooper and the county had determined based on evidence provided that she was a danger to herself. So it's not like the doctors could just say, we believe you, Michelle, and we're gonna release you. We can't, we have to do our due diligence to make sure that you are indeed safe. Right, but in the interim, by the way, I want to point out a few things, okay? So this is according to the probable cause statement by uh, released, uh, you know, to secure his arrest. When she gets to the hospital, there are numerous bruises and marks on her right side, specifically her forehead, torso, back, buttocks, forearm, knee, and lower leg, she had bruises and marks on her left knee and her lower leg. And very significantly, the medical records um, indicate that Michelle, while at the hospital, okay, um, she was agreeable with medical personnel. She displayed no suicidal, homicidal thoughts she had no major mood symptoms or overt psychosis. And you are right, that takes time for a doctor to meet with her and understand the backstory and then form a diagnosis. But clearly, clearly, these are significant injuries, significant injuries. And when they do a psychosocial, they find that she's not crazy. And in fact, there's no psychosis, there's no suicidality, there's no, there, there's no thought that she's going to harm anybody. And it did take five days to get there, um, but 
oh my goodness, oh my goodness, the hell that this woman went there to prove not only her innocence, but th she was the victim and she didn't suffer from mental illness. She had to prove to the doctors first and she did. She said, let me show you the text messages so you can see what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And when the doctors see the text message from Trooper Guy, who says, I know you're not crazy, but I know the law and I can make you crazy. That's when the doctors are like, oh my God, yeah. we, this, we believe this woman has been the victim of a setup. So the doctors call the police mm. and tell the police, you know what, we're releasing her. And we think it's a really good idea if you talk to her. And she willingly, happily talked to the police because yeah. she finally felt like someone was actually gonna listen to her. Yeah. And that's when she hands over her phone and she tells the police what happened. And here's the exact text message. When the police see this, they're like, oh, what an injustice has been done to this woman. Yes. Here it is. Ronald writes to her, quote, I know the law. I know you're not crazy. I'll paint you as crazy. Evil. What an evil man. Um, talking about abuse of your position of authority. I mean, there is, there are few examples more clear than this one. He knew the law. He knew how to work the system. Um, and he was, he, he, he was going to do everything in his power, including that the, the fact that he was a sworn deputy to punish her and take away her freedom. Again, yeah. no one would have believed her if this text message didn't completely contradict what he had said. It was proof, it was proof, say, authorities, that this was a complete setup. It was Correct. premeditated. He was going to do it. He told her he was going to do it, and he did it. Right. Correct. Correct. Unbelievable. 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 So he finally gets arrested. He gets arrested on September 21st, and he is charged with official oppression, felony strangulation, unlawful restraint, false imprisonment, simple assault, recklessly endangering another person, check mark, check mark, check mark, if you look at that videotape. My favorite part was the judge, though. <laughs> the judge denied him bail, and she said, and you will be committed against your will yes. behind yes. bars. Yes, I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. And yeah. just so you understand the seriousness of these charges, um, the strangulation charge in Pennsylvania carries up to 20 years in prison. These are very serious charges. And although some of these are charged as misdemeanors, if they are charged as felonies, the unlawful restraint, the serious bodily injury could have been up to five years in prison, the false imprisonment up to two years in prison, the simple assault up to two years in prison, the officer oppression up to two years in prison, and the recklessly endangering another, another person is between five to seven years in prison. Now, uh, it's our understanding that a lot of these have been charged as misdemeanors, but the strangulation that is the felony it's up to 20 years in prison. So these are very serious charges. And I have no doubt, I have no doubt um, that when the prosecutors are arguing this case, um, they are going, it, the conversation that you and I just had, where we're saying, you know, wow, did he abuse his trust? Um, that is gonna be the central theme of their case. Um, you know, the, the defense, um, to to uh, if you're on duty as an officer, um, the type of of force that you're using, um, there's always and there's always this idea that these are exigent circumstances that don't require an arrest that don't require a warrant for an arrest that these people are going to escape that they're going that they have a weapon all of those things and in the probable cause statement that the police release, they specifically talk about exigent circumstances and they say that um, 
there is a lack of exigent circumstances throughout the course of this entire incident. So even if that may be one of his defenses, the prosecution will be ready for it and they're going to nip it in the bud because first of all, he was off duty. Mm -hmm. He was off duty. I don't know what his defense will be and if this will go to trial, because frankly, with the amount of incriminating evidence, that videotape and, and that te- that text alone, I don't see, you know, what his defense is going to be. But an attorney representing him told NBC in Philadelphia that the attorney said, we're confident once all the facts come to light, Mr. Davis committed no crime but was seeking to protect a troubled young woman who was in need of immediate medical attention. Call 911, okay? Which, by the way, as a defense attorney, I'm going to tell you, because you know there's two sides to this, he is going to present a defense, he is going to present a defense, and he's going to try and get one or two jurors to believe that that he was truly only trying to help this woman. Whether it will fly, I don't know. But he'll say, look, you read a text where someone says, I'm going to drive off a cliff. That indicates to me that this is someone that's suicidal and in need of intervention. And that is specifically, specifically why the involuntary commitment statute um, under Section 302 was written to protect people like this. No harm, no foul. It's better to be safe than sorry. She did not kill herself, but I believed, I objectively believed that she was going to. So I always want to present both sides here. He is obviously not guilty until proven otherwise. He has an absolute right to a thorough defense. But I will say, I will say that the video that he directed (laughs) be shot may be his sinking ship. And the text message he sent to her where he says again, quote, I know the law. I know you're not crazy. I'll paint you as crazy. Yes. That's he to me. That is even more incriminating than the videotape. You know what I tell my clients, Anna? You have don't write anything. (laughs) You you have something to say. Tell your pillow. Period. End of story. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, I got to say. It's just my opinion, but uh, the only one really who looks like needs some serious mental health help here is the trooper. Is him. Yeah, but I will say after the what she has been through, after this incredibly traumatic experience, right. she is going to need a lot of help and support, medical right. help to get her through this traumatic right. experience. Not only the the being held, but then being you know, placed in an institution. I mean, my God. I actually find the commitment worse than the assault because <sighs> um, that that type of depra- deprivation of your liberty and your freedom and having to prove to people that you're not crazy. I mean, it's it's uh, beyond the pale. Yeah. I hope she sues. I hope she sues them all. Um, I think she has a case. I, I think she has a decent case against him for sure. I mean, I'm looking at 18 causes of actions. Now I'm looking at false imprisonment. I'm looking at assault. I'm looking, I mean, all of these things, intentional infliction of emotional distress, right? Oh, please. Everything. She's, yeah, she's got him now. True Crime Daily, the podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Have you ever had one of those episodes in your life where you've got these thoughts and they're going through your head and you can't sleep and they keep you up at night. I mean, we all suffer from a lot of stress. Well, it turns out that one great way to make those racing thoughts go away is to talk them through. Therapy gives you a place to do that so you can get out of that negative thought cycle and find some mental and emotional peace. We all go through hard things and therapy is a wonderful way to talk through it all and get another perspective. So if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's convenient, 
flexible and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Get a break from your thoughts with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash true crime daily today to get 10% off of your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash true crime daily. Our next case is just so sad and tragic. It's out of Cincinnati, Ohio, where a mother has pleaded guilty to contributing to the death of her three-year-old son, whom she left alone in the bathtub. She'd given the boy some Benadryl. She said that he was having some kind of an allergic reaction, which of course made him sleepy. And then she made, which is truly a fatal decision here, to leave him alone in the tub with Benadryl in his system. And then she said she was, you know, cleaning up, was tired, um, fell asleep, took a nap. And an hour and a half later, she wakes up and baby boy is in the bathtub, partially submerged and dead. Um, yes. And if all of those things are true, you are still, in my opinion, one of the most negligent mothers I have ever met to give a child Benadryl and then a three-year-old and then not watch them like a hawk knowing that in addition to uh, aiding in the allergic reaction, it's going to cause drowsiness. And then I've never heard, okay, I'm a mom of three boys. I've represented plenty of women in the past. I've never heard of a mother leaving a three-year-old child in a bathtub for an hour. I mean, I've never heard of them leaving a three-year-old in a bathtub unattended for any extended period of time. No, because because you can drown in a matter of seconds. And we know that. As parents, we know that. You know, you're constantly vigilant about your kids. You can't step outside of a tub, even if it's only two inches of water. We know that a baby can drown. We know this. Now, I look, I I was thinking about this case and I was thinking about those tragic cases where um, parents have left their child in a in a hot car. Yeah. And um, there was one case in particular. There was a professor who it was not his normal routine to take the child to the uh, uh, to the nursery or, you know, to whatever Take care, Mm -hmm. take care program. And he honestly forgot the child in the car. And he came back and the child um, had passed away. And I thought that is just the saddest, the guilt, the shame, the horror he must feel. Um, I'm not sure I feel the same way about Molly Krabs in this case. I'm not sure that this wasn't just an innocent mistake. And I'm definitely not saying that she intentionally killed them but but she she had claims in the past of some wrongdoing with another child at some point these children um were living with another family member um i believe there were some drug allegations against her um and i just don't see this as a simple tragic accident Yes, because some of those cases like, and you remember this woman who like, I think worked in a box store or something and she couldn't afford daycare and she left the child in the car and she kept checking on the child, but then it got too hot and the child died. Again, such a tragedy. We do hear of horrible things, horrible things that happen. And yes, at the end of the day, you're the parent and you are responsible. But I think what you're saying here about Molly is that there's so much in her background and the fact that the children were taken away and then finally placed back in her care makes you think okay it there's always been a little something there and this only happened three to four months after they were returned to her yes oh my god it's so so sad it's so sad (sighs) okay let's let's get into the details here and i can't wait to hear what you all think the mother who's 27 years old molly krebs originally entered a plea of not guilty when she was arrested. Now, this happened last year in December of 2022, and she was arrested on charges of involuntary manslaughter related to the drowning death of her three-year-old son, Jaden. Molly Krebs reportedly had an extensive history for drug charges, domestic violence, 
driving under the influence, and a few other things. She reportedly faced a previous charge for child endangerment back in 2017, and it's believed that that charge was later dropped. Now, here's the other thing, and we're going to get to the details of that night, but this is the background. Uh, Jaden, okay, so there's Jaden, and then there is an older son who's now eight years old. And according to published reports, Jaden and his brother spent much of their lives living with their grandmother, Mary Williams. The boys were also supervised by social workers. So according to court records, Molly received full custody of Jaden and his older brother in August of 2022, months before the death of Jaden. Four months. Now, this is Molly's version of events. Before we get to that, Allison, I do want to ask you, just given given this part of the public record, this is already troubling. It's going to be hard for anyone to believe that Molly really was a good mom. Well, I mean, look, it is not common that, uh, that the Department of Social Services here, Hamilton County Job and Family Services, are, open up a case and follow that child i mean it it's only there has to be some uh event that precedes their involvement and so we know for a fact that there is an incident and a claim of child endangerment in 2017. so when you string a few of these together it's not an it's it's a pattern it's a pattern of being a neglectful parent and that is, um, so So it bothers me that um, we don't know enough about what kind of treatment she was given, what she had to do to reunify with the family, because there are cases where the parent takes parenting classes and they abstain from drugs and alcohol, and all of these conditions have to be met before the children are reunified with the parent, which is the ultimate goal, but is reunification, but it only is to be done if they can guarantee or do the best they can to guarantee the children's safety. And this was only a few months later that her, her son tragically dies. And, you know, we have seen cases where there are parents who are struggling with addiction and they work very, very hard to get themselves together and better and eventually get their children back. But there are cases where that's the, that is the problem and the children are not endangered in the sense that they were never, how can I explain this? That, um, th that their actions never ever spilled over to the children. It, th they were never present when this thing happened. There are no accusations of harming the children. Are they capable of taking care of the children? No, not when they're intoxicated. But you know, you can understand a parent working their way through, but when there's that plus a form of either, you know, accusations of domestic violence and that the children have to be taken away because they're not being taken care of, that's a whole different story. It's a tell. It's a tell. It's a tell. It, yeah. It's a tell that this, this isn't simply a case of that poor father who wasn't used to taking his child to daycare yeah. and had his back, had his briefcase in the front seat and pulls up to work and leaves and only later realizes. I mean, that that, that is a pure accident. So yeah. um, I will let you continue and then I will give you some more thoughts. Okay, so let's get back to the day of the drowning. That would be December 1st. She said she had worked all day, returned home to host some guests. Well, I guess if you're tired, if you're so tired, what are you holding, You know, hosting some guests for? But that's just me being logical. Now, according to Molly, sometime after the guest left, Jaden had an allergic reaction to Nutella and that his face broke out in a rash. Okay, so Molly says that she gave Jaden Benadryl to help with the rash and she did this before she put him in the bathtub. Molly left Jaden in the tub for more than an hour. It looks like it was an hour and a half. She said she was so tired that she fell asleep. And she claims this was an accidental thing. She never meant to just go to sleep. When the mother finally wakes up and returns to the bathroom, she found Jaden in the bath, unresponsive. He was partially submerged. And about at 12 a.m., the ambulance arrives. He was unresponsive, pronounced dead at the hospital. Okay, midnight? 
What time did the boy get into the tub? If she says it was an hour, that would have been 10.30 to 11. It's pretty late for a three-year-old. Uh, yeah. 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 It's, um, uh, I, look, again, again, I the whole case is sort of troubling. You have all these friends over, um, you know, are they drinking? Is anyone watching the three-year-old? Um, and is it was she aware of a nut allergy? Was she aware of any type of allergies that the child may have? So these are all things that when I'm deciding whether or not to file charges, I want to know all of those circumstances. I want to know, was she drinking that night? Where was the child as her friends were there? Was there someone keeping an eye on a third on a, on a three year old? As we know, uh, my my husband and I used to call it suicide watch because they are running every every everywhere. They are smashing their heads into tables and jumping off couches, and it is a it is a all hands on deck time for raising a child. Yeah, absolutely. And you had three of them. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's enough to keep track of one. There's two yeah. of you and there's three of them, yes. you know, for you and your husband. Yeah. So uh, the day after, this would have been December 2nd, Molly appeared in court. She was charged with involuntary manslaughter and child endangerment. She was sobbing through the entire arraignment. She pleaded not guilty to the charges. And Molly's defense insisted that Jaden's death was completely an accident and nothing else. Now, the judge set Molly's bond at $750,000. Now, here is the part that enraged many, many people. At minimum, it is controversial. A week after her arrest, now she's being held. She's in jail. Molly asked the judge to let her attend her son's funeral, and special permission was given to Molly so she could attend the funeral. A lot of people got upset about that, including Molly's family. Correct. What do you think about that? I think that I've asked for it probably a dozen times in 27 years of practice, and I have been denied each and every time. That's what I think. I think that I have asked for a conditional release to attend a funeral, um, and my client was not the suspect charged in the death of that person and a judge said we don't do that i mean we, we don't let you have a day pass from jail so to say it's controversial it's also almost unheard of yeah it's it's really something i don't know how i feel about it i feel that uh, it's a serious charge even if it is a complete accident, as she says, she was the deciding factor, the contributing factor in the death of this child. There, there is her actions resulted by not watching him, at the very least negligence in this child's death. It is very, very sad. I mean, it is I sad. Will, I will obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the other side of this is the guilt, the shame, the sadness that she feels. Um, the judge may have said, um, this is the child's mother. And if this is truly an accident, how horrific, let her at least grieve with other family members during the funeral. I don't know, I wasn't in court that day when that decision was made, um, but I can certainly tell you from prior experiences, um, I've never heard of a judge. I've asked and I've been turned down multiple times. Yeah, very controversial, very controversial. According to prosecutors, Molly's story of what happened that night changed several times. That's a little troubling. It's also alleged that Molly had been using the extended bath time as a form of punishment. That's according to the older brother. And the older brother claimed abuse According to the Cincinnati Inquirer, which has done a lot of reporting here, the older brother told an investigator that he had seen his mother hit Jaden, yell at him, and once push him underneath the water and held him in there in the tub and said, this is according to the little boy, that if you don't shut up, 
I'm going to drown you. So hearing from the older brother make allegations of abuse, do you think this was the right charge, Allison? I think ultimately they um, they wanted to get a conviction. Um, and she ultimately pleads to the case. But there is a claim to be made that they could have charged her with murder. And the reason I say that is because there is that very damning interview by her other child that talks about prior incidents of physical abuse and one of the way that one of the ways that she abused her children was to submerge them in water and um, understanding the dangers of that so if in fact she give she she has friends there she gives the child the, the benadryl she leaves the child in the bath as a form of punishment which according to her other child she had done before and in fact submerged the child's head in water um although not a uh not a certainty and maybe maybe they the prosecutors did not believe they could they could prove it beyond a reasonable doubt um i think that the charge of involuntary manslaughter in this case was a gift for this woman. What I don't like is that her family, Molly's family, her sister and her mother have been very vocal. The mother who took care of the children, the grandchildren, have said not only are they upset, of course, but that investigators never talk to them as part of the death investigation. How can investigators not talk to other family members about what was going on in the family and with her abilities to care for these children when you were investigating a suspicious death? Um, There's no it, excuse for that. Look, not only that, the family was not only unhappy with the sentence, um, they wanted her, quote, uh, hold her accountable for once in her life because she is not done. When given the opportunity again, she will destroy more lives. She is evil, not capable of redemption. That is according to her own family. That's her sister. That's Molly's sister who said that. They were so upset with the judge. You know, Molly did end up changing her plea. And so two weeks ago, she entered a plea of guilty. That was on September 12th. And then she accepted the charges of, invol of involuntary manslaughter and child endangerment. And under Ohio law, Molly was facing a max of 11 years. So then on Tuesday of this week, on September 26, a judge sentenced Molly to six to nine years in prison. Reportedly, she'll serve six years, uh, could be an additional three years if there are any violations in, in prison if she like doesn't behave. So her own family thinks that this is not enough, that this was not right. Uh, Molly read a statement after she was sentenced. She was crying and she said, quote, the truth is that ever since I was a little girl, I longed to have a family of my own. The heartache of losing a child is one that I wouldn't wish on my worst nemesis. Okay, I agree. No one, no one but a parent can understand the pain of losing a child when you lose them. I get that. But the fact that Molly's own mother and sister are like, no, don't believe her crocodile tears. That's according to them. I mean, this is a massive loss. What I find interesting is that the family is now saying that they want to hold everyone accountable. Molly's sister said this in court, quote, the list of people responsible for his death is not limited to the defendant and includes state agencies, magistrates, judges, and law enforcement. If one person had cared as much as we did, listened to us to intervene in any way, Jaden might still be alive. I think the fact that the family is calling for an investigation and the county has started an investigation into how this child was allowed to fall through the cracks, I gotta listen to the family here. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree that um, unfortunately, this is a child who, um, with 
some intervention could have been saved. So now Molly's mother has temporary care of the older brother. Uh, now, of course, she's being watched like a hawk. And she said, OK, I understand that there needs to be true supervision here, but I can't even take him to the dentist without getting approval from a social worker. So it's like too it's little, been too late, too little, right? too late. It is too little, too late, too, too little, little, too late. late. Yeah. Ah, well, I, I honestly, and the fact that her own mother would say this about Molly, that she managed to pull the wool over the eyes of the court, and it's more time than she even gave him, I, I just, we're going to follow this case to see if anything happens. But you know what? I don't think anything's going to happen with social services. Nothing's going to change. Anna, I recently had a bar fight, a bar fight where the prosecutors and the judge were asking far more time um, uh, of my client in state prison than this case, which resulted in a death. So um, I, I think that the family um, has a right to be outraged, has a right to be outraged. I'm so upset by this case. Yeah, it's, it's awful. And especially awful, look, um, Parenting is difficult, and you can easily lose track of your child very quickly. And so um, on one hand, when I hear this story, I think, oh, my goodness, this is a parent's worst nightmare. Um, but when you hear it in context, it's like the case that we just covered. It is not simply that she forgot her child in the bath. It, the backstory fills out a much bigger picture here. And um, and it's, it's more than a tragedy for me. It's more than a tragedy for me. I, I do believe that there was a crime here. And obviously, so does the mother because she pled guilty and has been sentenced. So she accepted responsibility for causing this death. We have an update on a case that we've been following here on the podcast. It is the murder of Jamie Faith in Texas. Remember, he went out with his wife in the morning to walk the dog, and then they were ambushed, and he was shot and killed. This happened back in 2020 during the pandemic. Well, the wife, Jennifer, pleaded on television. You know, she said, please help me find the, my husband's killer. Of course, it turns out that Jennifer had plotted this whole thing with her high school sweetheart, a man she had recently reconnected with, Darren Lopez, a man who was discharged from the army with head injuries because of roadside bombings that he had you know, been injured by. So the two communicated like hundreds of times a day, Allison, and they were having this emotional affair because they'd never actually met. This all happened virtually. And then she convinces the boyfriend, Darren, that her husband was abusing her. Well, he wasn't. She made it all up. She used fake photos. So we reported that she had pleaded guilty, but Darren took his chance with a jury trial. Well, he did admit, this is fascinating, he takes the stand, he admits that he killed, he killed the husband, but he said that he had a brain injury, he had trouble processing things, and that he had been manipulated by her. Of course, the jury did not buy it, and in July, Darren was found guilty and sentenced to 62 years in prison. The, the crazy, twisted case, I mean, we've covered here, but now you could see all of it on ABC's 2020 this Friday. And here is a preview of that. I provide a little bit of commentary for this episode. In the morning on a bright, sunny day. Jamie Fates and his wife are heading out for their daily walk with their dog, Maggie. And then... <laughs> absolute chaos call the police shooting someone seven times at close range you can't call it anything else but an execution just incomprehensible this is a shocking sensational and unbelievable story it's a horrible way to die in front of your own home on a street a lot of the moments were captured on local doorbell cameras you've got this woman who's witnessed the worst thing that anybody could see she's witnessed the slaying of her husband. She was very distraught. She goes from crying to this hot, emotional affair with her high school sweetheart. She has two lives here. Now, Friday night. I have not been involved in a case that had more twists and turns. 
It starts getting darker and darker. It's diabolical. This is a, a powder keg. Everything that you knew or trust out the window. This case is about to go to a whole new level. My husband put two and two together and said, oh my gosh. You cannot make this up. The stunning all new true crime event, Happily Never After. The 2020 season premiere, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. That's ABC's 2020 this Friday at 9 p.m. or streaming on Hulu. It's one of those fascinating cases, you know. One of, just... one of my favorite parts of the case, if I'm remembering it correctly, is that he spent the night like looking through that. The boyfriend drives down and is like in another house right next door. Yes. And all of this unfold. Um, and, you know, when you're going to try and claim, when you're going to try and claim that as a result of mental uh, disease or, de or defect that you did this or that you're manipulated by somebody, um, understand that you are rolling the dice with the jury. Uh, if I was his counsel, and I've said this before, I probably would have been testifying against her. Well, she never went on trial because she took a plea deal. And as part of her plea, this was so important, she had to state for the court, because the, her husband is dead, that he never abused her because his family is hurt by the suggestion that he abused her and he didn't. It was all made up. So it was part of her plea deal. She had to set the record straight for that man's how family. Much, how much time did she end up getting? Do you remember? Oh, I think she's going to be in there for the rest of her life. And Darren got something like 62 years. Yeah. So he got a lighter sentence than she did because she really was the one plotting it. 62 years doesn't feel, feel that light to me, you know? No, but it is lighter than life. Correct. <laughs> it's semantics, right? This is, you know, <laughs> will Correct. he really live another 62 years? Anyway, that's this Friday night on uh, ABC's 2020. It is time for our comments section. These are the crime cases you all are talking about. Here's our producer, Will Updike. Hey, Will. Hey, Anna. How's it going? Good. Uh, you had some technical difficulties back last week, but you're back up and running. You know what? Nothing will stop me. I once had to complete the podcast on my phone and people were like, why does she sound so weird? Why does she look so weird? It's like, you know what, people? Give me a break. I, 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 go on, Ann. Anna. That's, go that's on. dedication. That's dedication. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this week we have a case of big trouble in Little Caesars. The case comes out of Knoxville, Tennessee, where a man has recently entered a plea regarding an incident in which he threatened Little Caesars employees with an automatic rifle because his pizza order was taking too long. Uh, we, you know, you know, I like to highlight these sorts of cases, people just kind of hangry, losing their mind. This one is actually a little older. The incident dates back to November of 2021 when the, uh, the suspect here, Charles Doty Jr. went to a local Little Caesars and ordered a pepperoni pizza, very normal order for the chain. He reportedly became upset when an employee informed him it would take about 10 minutes to prepare the pizza. Uh, he allegedly demanded free bread breadsticks before going outside <laughs> to wait for his order. You would think it's solved there. It is not. Uh, while he's outside waiting for his order, he retrieves an AK-47 from his no. vehicle. And when he re-entered the eatery, uh, he reportedly threatened the employees and asked for his pizza immediately. One employee told media outlets uh, that Charles Doty there was saying, where is my pizza? I want my pizza now. Uh, with an AK-47, uh, nothing nothing to screw around with. Uh, another employee told media outlets that it wasn't even a 10-minute wait when he came in with the gun. If he would have not come in with the gun and waited another two, maybe three minutes, would have already been boxed and in his hands. Sometimes it's, it's just a few moments there that you have to make a good decision or a bad decision. Uh, where this one gets a little bit scarier is one of the workers uh, tried to leave the restaurant and Doty reportedly threatened that employee they ended up going into another room and calling the police. So that's kind of oh, how this God. all came together. Um, as I said, he just appeared in court uh, at the end of last month on this charge. And he entered a blind plea, which, Allison, I, I'm not super familiar with that, what that means. So essentially, there's not like normal sentencing guidelines or recommendations if, if he had just if he had just pled guilty to the charges or how does so that work? Sometimes, and I don't know if this is the case, uh, we'll have a client plead open so you will admit the charges 
and then you'll have a sentencing hearing where there's a range and the judge, it's not an agreed upon disposition, and the judge will set the sentence. So defense attorneys will argue for the low term, prosecutors will argue for the high term, and then the judge, um, and maybe that's why it's called a blind plea, but here here in California, we call it an open plea. You, you It's blind because you don't know what the ultimate decision the judge is gonna make is. Gotcha. So it's not like a deal or anything like that where you plead guilty and you get, you know, maybe some sort of reduced sentencing. Well, it, it sounds to me like it's not. It sounds to me that you have a sentencing range from the low term to the high term, and then the judge ultimately decides, but you don't know in advance what your sentence would be. But gotcha. you're not fighting gotcha. the charge. You've entered a plea of guilty and you present evidence as to why you're asking for probation or low term or whatever that is. Gotcha. So we'll find out a little bit more on the sentence. Uh, he's scheduled to be sentenced on September 29th. People had a lot to say about this one. They like the fast food cases. Uh, Andrew M came in with the, you know, just classic wisdom from any parent or grandparent. Patience is a virtue. Uh, <laughs> the one that kind of gets me about this case is like, I cannot name a pizza place that is faster than Little Caesars. Like I, I cannot mm -hmm. think of one. Pizza, uh, so, pizza. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you, if you can't wait that long, I, I don't know. I don't know what your expectations are. Yeah, I, I think that his troubles lie uh, much further than in pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there's definitely more than pizza going on at play here. Uh, Renee G said, you would think the breadstick should have taken the edge off. Guy's not messing around when he's hungry. Yeah, I I feel like, too, if you're you're getting the olive branch of, of you know, some, yes, some something to sticks. eat. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But what more do you want? What more do you want? Mama Mia had a good one. They said he had to use his big gun to threaten little Caesar. Which <gasps> That's funny. Yeah, AK-47, yeah. I mean, that is, uh, that's pretty Serious. heavy for a, for a pizza dispute. Uh, Samika said he wanted it hot, but it wasn't ready, which I feel like great pun, just just a very poetic sentence to me. Uh, but I'm gonna wrap this one up with Jesse L who has a reference to a, a classic hip hop song. Uh, if you're from LA, you'll definitely know. Jesse L said, Ice Cube would be sad. He had to use his AK. Today wasn't mm. a good day. Not which, a good day. Uh, it was not a good day. Not a good not day a good for day. anyone involved. But that is going to do it for this week's comment section. Thank you, everyone, who left those comments over on our YouTube community page. You can also reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, anywhere you enact with social. We're probably there. We'll probably be there. Uh, but that'll do it for this week, and I'll see you all next week. Allison, it's always such a pleasure. I could talk to you all day. I know today we ran long just because it's, you know, I can't get enough of my Allison. Well, and I'll tell you, I, I mean, it's such an honor to be on your show. I love what a great investigative journalist you are. You've always, you have such integrity and you you um, you really spend the time to understand these cases and um, you you explain them so well to the listener. Um, Really, you're such a such a great job. I, I love you Thank as a friend, you. but I also love you as a colleague because you are the best of the best. Oh, thank you, Allison. And you, I mean, you know, you bring so much humanity to this. We have people from all different parts of criminal justice. And, you know, obviously a defense attorney's role in life is, is to defend. But yeah. your humanity always shows and your common sense always shows and you do look at both sides and don't just, you know, look at it from one perspective. Because the thing is, we're talking about people, they're complicated and their decisions are complicated and their lives are complicated. So you can't just look at one action from just a narrow point of view in order to understand a case and why someone did what they did. Right. And, you know, um, I always say, you know, but for the grace of God, go I. And... Um, so many of the cases that I've handled in my career um, involve serious, untreated mental illness. Yes. And I am a big advocate um, of, of treating and addressing head-on mental illness. Um, I, I believe that a lot of cases would not be filed in our system if we took preventative measures um, to get these people seen and treated and medicated. Yeah, absolutely. Well, where can people find you? I know you're always on television and or in the court, but where can people so, follow you? Um, so I am the legal expert at KTLA. 
Um, I have a segment on Access Hollywood with Mario Lopez called Trending with Treasel. And then I am a practicing uh, criminal defense attorney in Los Angeles. Excellent. Uh, you can find me at Anna G News on all social media platforms. You can find this episode, all episodes of our podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to our newsletter at truecrimedaily.com. So until next week, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.